Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our June 2021 IFRS webinar. Um, good morning, Kevin. Good morning, Aletta. It's lovely to hear your voice again. <laughs> lovely to see you, my favorite IFRS person. And I'm really oh, looking forward. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to the session today. We're going to look at cash flow forecasting for impairment testing and going concern. And we now, and we know as 30 June is coming up, this is a big issue. Um, and um, you would know by now that if leases is the topic, um, I give nobody else chance because I love leases. And Kevin is about, is, is like that when it gets to impairment. I've begged okay. to present this session and he insisted on presenting the session. So Kevin, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I'm and really that's so true, a letter. When I was preparing the slides, I was like, "There's no way you're getting any of these. You're not touching them. You only get the beginning and the end." <laughs> so, Kevin, thank you very much that I can introduce the topic today and say thank you at the end. But I'm really looking forward uh, to the session. Um, Kevin's got a real passion for the impairment testing, and he does a lot of workshops with chartered accountants in this space as well. Um, so, if you've got any questions. Kevin is your man. I do want to start by reminding everybody that we are running at BDO, we're running a business growth program. And it's all around the concept that there's a financial consequence to every business decision. Now, I'm running the business growth program personally in Melbourne, and we're doing it virtually. I've got another information session running this afternoon. This program runs over 12 months. It's one day a month. Um, and as I say, in Melbourne, we're running it virtually and we look at all kinds of stuff. We start with financial management and we look at a lot of tools. We look at sales and marketing. We look at HR. We look at business operations. Um, and uh, on the next slide, I've got all the topics for the 12 months. Um, in Melbourne, uh, BDO would like to invest and help Victorian businesses. And therefore, we've also launched a number of scholarships. Um, it's on my LinkedIn profile, it's on our BDO website, so if you think you would qualify for a, a full scholarship, uh, please apply. Applications close next week, 30 uh, June, and, and then we'll let you know by the end of next week. Um, so, uh, really excited about that. I've got a few clients already coming, um, very topical for not-for-profits. Um, so, you know, how do we look at the strategy? How do we look at financial planning? But also, how do we do our so, uh, our impact statements, um, social media? How do we get funding? Uh, we also have some uh, practitioners. So, in Melbourne, I've got an osteo who's got her own business who wants to know more about this. Uh, a physio who's joining. A number of startups joining. Uh, so, this has been run um, across the country face-to-face. Uh, but if you want to do it virtually, you're welcome to join my session. So I just wanted to talk about that again. We have two intakes. There's a July intake for 12 months, and there's a January intake that will be January next year. Um, Kevin, I think the next slide is around the purpose of today's session, and I'm so worried that I get this wrong. I'm just going to uh, listen and hand over to you, and I hope everybody enjoys today's session. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Aletta. And that is the shortest introduction you've ever done on a webinar, four and a half minutes flat. But that means I, I can't just go into it. I think I need to talk about your stuff a little bit more. I'd like to encourage you to really go and look at what Aletta was talking about regarding the um, the business growth program. Um, I mean, Aletta said she's running it in Melbourne, but obviously it, it's across the board. And, 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 and really, it is something that I can see the benefit of for a lot of our clients, but even just individuals as well. So please, please go and investigate that. Um, even if you're not in Melbourne, um, I'd like to encourage you to do that. It is starting to take off. Um, all right, so jumping into today's session, and Aletta's right, this is my passion area. I, 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 the story about how I got involved in impairment was, was because I paired up with a valuation expert 14 years ago and we nutted it out one night in a in a pub over a beer about why it was that impairment and shall we call business valuations don't interact or why they don't speak to each other um and and somehow i found myself becoming sort of really intrigued on how the valuation side interacted with um impairment and it became clear to me very early on 
um, that it really all starts with how the budgets and the cash flow forecasts interact. So in a way, this session has been 14 years in the making um, because one of the biggest issues we run into when we do impairment, and, and bearing in mind impairment is impairment of um, carrying amounts of assets on, on your balance sheet for financial reporting purposes, doesn't always speak to, shall we call it, business strategy and especially business budgeting and, and cash flow forecasting. Um, and one of the key areas we run into is why can you budget and forecast in your organization, let's say restructures and growth and um, investments in, you know, um, resetting um, assets and you know, building the organization, um, investing in new capital uh, capital equipment. Why can't you take that into account in your impairment assessments? So the impairment assessments never really spoke to or never really speaks to the budgets and the cash flows. And it all comes down to really today's session is why why or how do these speak to each other? So it's, it's foundational in the sense that we're going to talk about how your budgets and your cash flow forecasts, which really are a function of business strategy, interact with impairment assessments. But when we designed the session, we realized that it's more than just that, because there's two other areas of accounting um, or financial reporting that interact with budgeting and cash flow forecasting, and that's going concern and solvency. The title of the session doesn't actually talk to solvency, but when I was putting the session together, I realized I couldn't talk about, could not talk about solvency assessments. So going concern solvencies and impairment assessments, which really are assessments for financial reporting purposes, interact with budgets and cash flows and how do they interact not only with budgets and cash flows but how do they interact with each other that's what we're going to look at today and really i'm going to give away the purpose of the session today it's actually about the purpose of these assessments and how the purpose drives the adjustments that you make to budgets and cash flows which are used in each of the assessments and really that's the key takeaway today is that you cannot do a budget and a cash flow from a business point of view and use it unadjusted almost for the assessments for going concern, solvency and impairment, because those three assessments have different purposes and different objectives. And so there's always an adjustment required somewhere. And that adjustment is what gets all excited when we come to financial reporting um, and when we try to do these things um, at, at year ends. So that's the purpose. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put terminologies down. Um, I'm going to use two terms, two terms today, and they're going to be very specific to this presentation. Um, budget and forecast. Um, they don't always mean these things in the real world, um, uh, uh, but for, for the purpose of today, when I refer to the, 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 the term budget, what I really mean is an ass assessment of revenue and expenditure. So my budget of revenue minus expenditure gives me an operating profit. Now, whether that operating profit is an EBITDA measure or something like that, it's profit-based. Um, whereas a forecast in this session is, is very specifically a cash flow projection. Now, in reality, a forecast is 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 often something that um, comes after the budget period. So you, some, some, some people refer to a budget as the profit budget for next year and the forecast will be the period after that. Or sometimes the forecast is the rolling forecast period after the budget period. None of that's going to apply today. Today, purely for this presentation and simplicity, budget is a profit measure for the next 12 months and a forecast is the cash flow projections based on that budget. Um, that, that's what I'm going to be um, referring to today. So let's jump straight into it, the basics. So the basics, what, when and why. It took me almost three hours to put the slide together because I really had to choose my words carefully about what was important. But really the red, the, red, the red text on the first line of this table is probably the most important part of, of, of this session, the difference between what these three assessments are. Now, a solvency assessment is really driven in this case by corporate legislation. Uh, and, 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 and the one I'm going to be referring to today is a company uh, requirement or corporation's requirement for directors to declare uh, that the that the entity is solvent, um, and that and that really just basically means that the entity is able to pay its debts as and when they become due and payable. Um, in other words, you're not trading while insolvent. Now, I'm not going to get into COVID. Um, implications of solvency. I know that there's been some relaxation of these principles and, and the ability to trade while insolvent because of COVID. Uh, let, let's just ignore all of that today. It's back to basics. So basic principle, entity shouldn't trade while insolvent. That means it can pay its debts as and when they become due and payable. How does that differ to a going concern assessment? Well, a going concern assessment is very, very closely linked 
But basically what it says is the entity is preparing its financial statements on a basis, a going concern basis. The assumption is that you're going to carry on trading um, for the foreseeable future, let's say, unless management intends to liquidate or cease trading or has no realistic alternative but to do so. Now you can see really there's a difference here because the one is a basis of preparation for financial statements. In other words, it assumes ongoing operations, whereas the other one talks about the ability to pay debts as and when they become due and payable. So there's a link, but they're not the same. Impairment is also linked, and that's got to do with the carrying amount of assets being not greater than the recoverable amount. So those are the three basic um, um, principles driving these. Now, what's required on a solvency? There's a declaration required um, from directors that needs to go um, into financial reports. Um, but also, directors um, need to make sure the entities are always trading under solvent conditions. So the ongoing assessment means you really have to always make sure that, 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 that the entity is trading under solvent conditions. Whereas the going concern is an assessment really at the, at the time of preparing financial statements or at least issuing financial statements. And the impairment is an assessment that happens at least at the reporting period end. But if you've got goodwill, you'll normally be doing impairment assessments um, at, at particular times in the year, but mostly impairment assessment is at the reporting date. So you can see already we're starting to have a divergence amongst the solvency is an ongoing thing, but also a declaration at the time of issuing the report. Going concern is an assessment at the time of preparing financials, but also is linked to the date of signing of the report, and impairment is at the date of report, so um, you know, literally at the year end. Now, I'm not going to get into things like um, well, I do need to get into the forecast period, so I'm going to jump over things like um, the, the the audit requirements and the legislative requirements. Um, you know what the 12 month forecast periods are. Um, essentially, to get down to the solvency forecast period, when you're using cash flow forecasts, you don't need to use a cash flow forecast to 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 test solvency, but but it's very often impossible to do so because cash flow forecasts which are in, in, in this presentation forecast based on budgets, are often prepared to project forward the cash flow deficiency, shall we say. The whole, whole thing with the solvency is, can you pay your debts as and when they become due and payable? That's very much done at a reporting date or at a date of signing when you're doing a declaration. But in order to project forward and find solvency risk, um, you will often use cash flow forecasts to say, well, what are my revenues inflows? What are my expense outflows? And when is there a timing difference between those such that I've got a deficit in my cash flows? And that deficit might mean if I've got to pay my debts during that deficit period, can I pay my debts? Do I have enough cash reserves to pay debts during those deficit periods? And is there a solvency risk in that period? So that's really where cash flow forecasts often are used for solvency. The forecast period isn't defined because the solvency assessment is at the time of the assessment. You need to be able to pay your debts as and when they become due and payable at the date and really when they become paying, pay, uh, due and payable. Going concern is all about forecast periods and this is where it gets tricky because in Australia the forecast period is at least 12 months forward. So at the date of signing financials um, or at the date of preferring financials you really need to, if you are using a cash flow forecast to make a going concern assessment, what you're looking for there is that you're actually able um, in the next 12 months to carry on trading. Um, now, what does that mean? It's not only about uh, paying debts, it's actually about evaluating scenarios where there's high or severe liquidity risk. Now, that's slightly different to solvency, but kind of the same thing. What this really means is you can carry on operating. Where a solvency thing is, is, is pure pay your debts as and become due and payable, a going concern is high or severe liquidity risks which actually imp impact operations. Um, basically, do you have enough money to keep operating? Now that's different to paying your debts and that's why the going concern is slightly different to solvency. It's very much linked to keeping operations going and there is a 12 month forecast period. There's some, there's some debate always about what that 12 month forecast period is because it's actually um, 12 months from the reporting date, but actually when the auditors get into this, they're gonna need 12 months from the date of issue of the financials. So if you're issuing your financials sort of three months after year end, the 12 month period is actually gonna be 12 months from the date of issue, which is actually 12 plus three after your reporting date. So just bear that in mind, there is a forecast period in the going concern assessment, whereas in the solvency, it's all about, can I pay my debts at the date when they're due and payable? Impairment is 
completely different. It's based on essentially budget and forecast periods that are no more than five years from the reporting date. And now we're talking forecast periods five years ahead. But most organizations only budget 12 months out and then they just extrapolate for the other four years. So you can see already where I'm going with this presentation. How does the cash flow forecasting and the budget interact? All these assessments make use sometimes or, or are required to make use of cash flow forecasts, but they've all got different either points of assessment or forecast periods or budget periods. And so you can see see where the, where the variations are already coming from. Its timing is one of the big Im impacts of how budgets and forecasts get adapted for these things. Now impairment, just remember if, if, if impairment, I'm going to assume a level of understanding in today's presentation where impairment very much looks like this. When you're doing a value in use, if you're doing a value in use as your impairment assessment, it's often a five year DCF for the terminal value in the fifth year. I mean, there are variations to this um, but the but the but the first year cash flow forecast is very much the one that's linked to your forecast budget whereas years two three four and five and the terminal value are based on extrapolations of the budget or forecast in year one um, so just that that's that's really the, the the base assumption in today's presentation okay so let's get into it let's get back to the budget process now this is a little bit out of my depth. I'm, I'm not a cash flow forecasting specialist. We have those people at BDO who, who do this and we'll be talking about some of them at the end of the, in, in, end of the session. But it is important that, that we have an understanding of the budget process because when budgets start, no one prepares a budget for impairment assessments. People prepare a budget for purposes of running their business. This is budget, a budgeting process, and I actually base this on uh, on the sorts of things we see here at BDO. You know, we we, we have a, 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 a process that generally starts out in, let's say, January each year when your year end is June, where you look at your review, your, your past budget process, you understand what, why you didn't meet budget or what happened last year, actual difference. So you do a, a causational cause, causes of difference adapt and plan your budget process accordingly and then off you go into let's put a budget together for next year so first of all it's the budget process the process is essentially a system or system of controls you know if, if a proper budgeting process that's reliable is essentially a, a control system it's a it's a, it's, it's a system of a financial system of the business where actually you need proper controls of accuracy completeness reliability and all those things and if you have uh, past budget processes before you actually do a, a, a Good budget season, you will get to grips as an organization with how, how do we budget last year, what did we get wrong, what were the causes, how do we adapt our budgeting process. Once you've got your process ready and the people involved, um, management or director's visions will be translated into goals. Those goals will have sort of reality or shall we say measurements attached to them, KPIs, and then you'll actually go and build your budget. A good budget will have two things on the budget. Um, it'll, there'll be scenario builds of possibilities. In other words, not 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 every budget um, uh, can be achievable, or, or is essentially just we, you know what, one set of possibilities. There's there's a range of possibilities that can happen, and that's especially true during COVID. You know, are we going to achieve our budget? What are the alternatives? What are the probabilities of that alternative? We call those scenario builds. So budgeting in theory, you'll have a couple of scenario builds in there before settling on the final one. Um, and that'll then get approved by management. And then down into stress testing the forecast. And what stress testing is, is, is actually linked more to the forecast because your possibilities in your budget are drive your, shall we say your profit figure, but your stress testing of your forecast is generally um, around what are my cash flow alternatives? So a stress test in this presentation refers to your for cash flow forecast, scenario build refers to your budget. And what do we mean by the stress testing of the forecast is very simple is if you have various budget alternatives, what does your cash flow get impacted by? And when do you run out of cash, which is your solvency test? And when does that impact your operations, which is your going concern assessment? And that's what we mean by stress test forecast. But ultimately, by the time you get to your year end, you'll align your forecast and your budget to current covered evidence and off you go. For the next financial year, you establish a rolling forecast in July and then around about August or July, you finalize your impairment and your corporate responsibility assessments. Now, what I mean on the left hand side of this diagram in August by corporate responsibility assessments, that's going concern insolvency. Those are corporate 
corporate responsibility, corporate law type assessments. You have to do a solvency and a going concern assessment if you're under Corporations Act. Uh, you've got to do those assessments and impairment assessment also has to be done around about year end because that's your reporting date. But the arrow on the left is our problem in some organisations because the corporate responsibility assessments can very much move out depending on when you issue your financials. If you are, if you're not a listed entity and let's say you're issuing your financials in November, then you're only going to really get down to your your solvency and going concern assessments before you issue your financials, let's say in November. But your impairment assessments are going to have been done in June at the reporting date. Now that's important because already you can see where I'm heading with this is. Budgeting and forecasting all starts in before year end, and that forms the basis of all the assessments in, in many cases. But by the time you get to your year end, depending on the dates of your three assessments, solvency, going concern, and, and, and impairment, they can start to all be done at different times. And you can see that the timing will start to make make differences and changes to the way you do this. Because your impairment assessment is very seldom uh, very seldom done um, very, very far after the year end. You base your impairment assessments at the reporting date. But if you're going concerned and insolvency assessments are only being done at the time you issue your financials, and your financials are way out from your year end, you, your, your rolling forecasts will have changed by then. You, you, you know, if you're halfway through your next financial year, your forecasts will have changed, and the assessments will already re, re, really merged, so uh, emerge, uh, demerge from each other. So that's the first thing to bear in mind: is the longer the period between the three assessments. The, the more changes there will be to the underlying forecast because of rolling factors. So that's your budget process. Goals, most organizations before they put a budget together will establish next year's goals. Now these are important because this is the, this is especially important for, for when you get to impairment because these are the actions you would like to take to grow the business or increase profit or buy assets or pay down debt. These are the goals that you'd want to commit to, but they're not always goals that are that are aligned with impairment testing. So before you actually get to your impairment testing, the first thing is to understand very clearly in your budget process, what goals have you built in there and which, which of those are actually committed to and can't be undone. Um, I'll come back to that for a later, but essentially the one big process of budget, everybody wants to increase profit or pay down debt or so forth. But if you want to grow your business or purchase more assets, those are capital, what I call capital commitments. And capital commitments often get unraveled as the year goes on, um, as factors change. But most goals will be built into budgets growth and purchase of assets, or call them capital goals, will be built into budget targets. And by the time you actually get to the year end before you start the next financial year and your cash flow forecast, those will be kind of locked in and everybody will be working towards them. They are all important for going concern and for solvency assessments, but very often those capital commitments are irrelevant for impairment, impairment testing. So not only do you have a timing problem with impairment, but also impairment testing sometimes ignores, shall I call it, the capital goals. So it's very important to sort of, first of all, understand what you've put into your budget and also then which ones are going to carry over into the various assessments. I'm not going to go through this too much. Um, this is just the sorts of budgets you have and so forth. This, this session isn't so much about the budget process. I think I've kind of spent a bit of time on, on that. It's just about the various types of budgets you have. You know, you can have zero-based bottom-up budgets, capital-driven budgets, your traditional budgets, which is really last year plus a percentage. Um, all of those are relevant and, and valid if you've, if you've got proper systems of controls around them. But the most important thing with, with aligning your budget and your cash flow forecast with these assessments is to make sure that they are reliable. A budget that can't be achieved is irrelevant to any of those assessments. If there's no alignment between the budget process and the forecast period and the achievability of the budget, then it really just doesn't matter that, that you followed a budget process. This whole process on all three assessments really does, uh, does assume an achievable and reasonable Budget, uh, budget and, and forecast pops out. So I'll leave that behind um, and jump straight to um, what the purpose of the budgets are. And this starts to align the session of today. Most budgets which start out, let's say, six months before the year end for next year are really a roadmap for how the business might perform. The goals and objectives are built into the budget, including capital goals like purchasing assets and growing the business. It's a communication tool, you set KPIs. But the purpose of the budget and the forecast that drop out for purposes of the three assessments start to change depending on the assessment. 
from a solvency and a going concern assessment, the budget and the forecast is a tool to assist with those. But in terms of impairment assessments, it's not even a tool so much as just a, a source of input because the impairment assessments are quite different to um, uh, the, to solvency and going concern assessments, where solvency and going concern are very much based on the numbers in the budget and the rolling forecast. In impairment assessments, they're actually very much just a source of input to be adjusted based on what the nature of the impairment test is. And that, I think, is, if I, if I kind of stand back, that's probably the purpose of today, is to actually draw a line between how different an impairment assessment is compared to really everything else. Budgeting, forecasting, solvency and going concern are almost statements of fact in terms of where the entity sees itself in the next 12 months. An impairment assessment is actually a historical assessment that the existing assets can maintain their carrying amount. And it almost has nothing to do with each other, which means the impairment assessment is the one that's adjusted the most. And so um, on this slide, the words un underlined are actually the ones I want to communicate across. Where, where, where the budgets and the forecast assist with solvency and going concern, they're actually just a source of input for impairment assessment because the input gets fundamentally adjusted depending on the purpose of the impairment. And sometimes the budget and the forecast for impairment doesn't look anything like the budget and the forecast for the solvency and the going concern, depending on the nature of the assets. So this then underlines really where we're going with an impairment assessment. Um, what is an impairment assessment? An impairment assessment is actually just um, an assessment of whether the assets can maintain their carrying amount in their current use. And so the, the key difference um, when it comes to impairment assessments and cash flow forecasting is that you can't include in the cash flow forecast for impairment anything other than what the current assets can do in their current condition. And that comes back to what I call the capital, the capital goals. If you're looking to grow the business through purchasing of new assets and let's say refitting the assets of the business, but you haven't committed to those at the reporting date, those assumptions will be stripped out of your value in use cash flow forecast for impairment testing because the impairment test isn't about what you're planning to do. The impairment test is about what the current assets in their current conditions can do if nothing else changes. And so you very often have to strip back your budget because the purpose of a value in use impairment test is to test that the carrying amount of the assets in their current condition can maintain themselves. Not what they can do for purposes of capital goals, but what they can do for purposes of current condition, how can they perform and can they maintain themselves? And that really is the big difference between the three. So now I've kind of changed this, this slide a little bit and I've stripped out some of the lines and or rows in the table and I've brought it back to the base assumption. The underlying method and assumption that the last row in this table is the most important one for how our cash flow forecasting aligns with the three assessments. When you're doing a solvency assessment, and let's assume you are using a cash flow forecast for that, what you're actually doing is you're using a rolling forecast, cash flow forecast, to constantly adjust to the economic events so that at the time of looking at the forecast purposes of an insolvency test, you're actually looking for, am I trading under actual insolvent conditions? And in, and, and plan for those. It's pretty much point in time. So your forecast needs to be rolling. If you're only doing your solvency assessment at the time of signing financials, then at that date, you're going to look at a rolling forecast, which is up to date with the most recent economic conditions. And what you're going to ask yourself is, does the cash flow forecast drive the ability for me to pay my debts as and when they become payable? That's the solvency assessment. At the same date, you might actually be doing a going concern assessment. What is a going concern assessment? Going concern assessment is, can I substantiate that my financial statements can be prepared on a going concern basis? I'm looking at 12 month forecasting ahead, so it's also a rolling forecast. Um, but what this does is you're actually not looking for, can I pay my debt as and when they become due and payable, but you're actually looking for here yeah, is, is there a high liquidity risk situation that's gonna impact my operations? In other words, I'm gonna run out of money and I can't operate anymore. That, that's really the purpose of, of the going concern at, at its most basic. And the way you do that is you take your, your, your 12 month rolling forecast and adjust it for various modeling scenarios at that date to try and identify, is there a possibility of a high severe period of liquidity risk that could impact operations? 
do I have plans to mitigate those and will those plans work? In other words, will I be able to keep operating during those high liquidity periods? And the impairment assessment is completely different. The impairment assessment, not only does that happen at the reporting date, which might be different to the date of the going concern and the solvency assessment, but the impairment assessment is actually assessing the cash flows as they relate to the assets in their current condition. In other words, can the assets at the reporting date in their current condition recover their carrying amount? Goals that are capital goals that are not yet committed to, such as refitting the assets or restructuring the business or buying new assets are stripped out of the cash flow forecast because they're not in the current carrying amount of the assets at the reporting date because the assets in the reporting date are only the assets as they exist at the reporting date. If you haven't committed to any of those capital goals, they must be pulled out because what you're trying to do is align the current condition of the assets on the balance sheet with their current ability not with what's going to happen in the future. And you can see then that the underlying assumptions and methods um, you know, are, are quite different at that point. Now, there was a lot, there was a lot to take in there. And, and, and when I was putting this together, I thought, at this point, I kind of just want to jump off a cliff because how, how does this look in practice? Um, and so what I've actually done is I've pulled an example off the web. Now, I will admit, this is not necessarily the best example, but it was one that I liked during during COVID. So it's the next PLC. So it's next the, clo the clothing retailers um, uh, in the UK, um, where they issue, I think every three months, they, they issue a cash flow model and a sales and profit outlook. And what I liked about theirs is the way they actually aligned um, the messaging in 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 their in their trading summary to, to trading forecast with with the with the three assessments we're trying to do yeah especially on the going concern and solvency now you don't have to do it this way it's just that it embodied everything i've been talking about in a very nice way so i'm going to i'm just going to use this and I've, I've, I've given you a link at the top of the page here where you can actually go down download the trading summary i don't think they do this for purposes of going concern and solvency per se it's just that it aligns very nicely and so it's a good example of how if you're doing this even as a small organization you can outline or you can document your going concern and solvency in this sort of format and it meets all the bits and pieces that i've been talking about so the first thing that they do when they get there, and I'm using the, I'm using a, a very specific one. This was their uh, trading outlook um, in, I think it was January 2020. So it was just as COVID was raising its head. Um, and so what they did was they issued a trading statement. I mean, they, they were quite, they're quite ahead of the pack. Um, they issued this in January and then updated it in March. So, so the, the one that I've got on the screen is the March 2021, but it was actually in January 2020. They were already talking there's this COVID thing coming. I don't even think it had a name then, but they knew there was something happening and it was going to have an impact on them. Um, so this is essentially a, 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 a it, it's, it's a budget that gave rise to a forecast. And then as, as conditions started to change, they updated the forecast, in other words, rolling forecast, and actually followed each of the steps to get to their going concern and solvency assessment. So the first thing they did was they said, okay, let's have a look at our pre previous budgeting um, uh, year. They took their actuals in 2020, January 2020, which is their year end, um, and they compared it to their budget process in 2019. They laid out the variances and they actually did an analysis of what they got right and what they got wrong. And you can actually see on the retail margin analysis, which is on the screen, that they literally compared their margin, their markup, their stock losses, and there were pluses and minuses of how far off they were from, from their budget. Um, store occupancies was a bit down, um, and their net margin compared to sales was 8.9%, which, which they then actually outlined um, the reasons for that. And they actually decided, does that mean we need to change our budgeting process in any way? I don't think they did, but they at least did understand what was different in their budgeting process and their cash flow forecasting process from one year to one year, January 22, January 2019. And I understood the differences and they adapted their budgeting process from there.
then what they did was they said, all right, what are our financial goals for the next year? So this is the visions of the board and of management. And they actually said that their, their, their key goals were, were built in. I mean, everybody wants to increase profit, but the very specific goal that they had in mind here was actual capital capital commitments. They they were planning to do retail space expansions, maintenance expansions. Um, there was some head office infrastructure, which I think was software um, and systems which they wanted to implement. So they, they had a budget um, in January 2020 of 139 um, I think it's a million pounds versus versus their previous year. That was their capital commitments. In other words, these were their financial goals and they built this into their budget. So they'd committed to these at least at a board level. Uh, they might not have signed contracts and so forth, but certainly this was the plan. Um, what they actually did, just as a notice, they then adjusted that because in January 2021, oh sorry, January 2021, um, that, 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 that part was way ahead um, of, of current plans. So, so that, that's actually not relevant to this discussion. I'm actually looking at the January 2020 column. That was their current plan at that time when they were actually doing this budget analysis. What they did do though, um, when they looked at this, they adjusted this for COVID. And what started to happen in March 2020 when they actually fin issued this as a final trading statement is they knew that the coronavirus had started and there was something happening. And they actually went and had a discussion amongst themselves and they realized that the supply chain was what was going to be impacted. So there's a whole piece um, on the supply chain impacts of this. And what they did was they actually adjusted what they thought was going to happen to their cash flow forecast because of that. So what they did was said, okay, fine, we've got our budget, we've got our forecast, let's play around with this. What's our base case cash flow model? So now we, we remember we're at the year of, of January 2020, they've updated it to March 2020, so they're starting to do a rolling forecast here. Um, and they actually did a bit of a test and they said, well, the base case of our, of our model is that we will have enough cash and headroom in our cash flow forecasts to pay our debt. So there's actually two things going on here. They've actually done a solvency assessment and a going concern assessment in one using a cash flow forecast. Now the going concern assessment is, do we have enough cash in order to operate for the next 12 months? And you can see the 12 months laid out on the bottom, February to January. Now in Australia, if you were doing this, you would have done this for 12 months um, after the date of issue. So that might move along a little bit. So I said in this case, because they issued this in March, 2020, I would actually have done this to March 2021 um, because Australia kind of pushes it 12 months out from issue date or date of issue. But then the solvency assessment is the headroom. Do we have enough cash to meet our debts as we as they become due? And that's really the headroom um, that you can see the green arrow. So there's a solvency and a going concern. And in theory, at this point, there's no real risk in either. But then they started to get to stress testing and scenario build. They said, all right, well, this whole COVID thing is happening. What's going to happen? And really, nobody had an idea. So what they actually did was they scenario build. They said, if our supply chains hit us and if people can't shop in our stores, what's going to happen if our revenue decreases by 10%, 20%, and 25%? I mean, in a way, I think those three scenario builds were actually just pulled from the sky because nobody knew what was going to happen at that time. But they basically forecast what would change in our revenue over over the period if that has to happen. And notice we're still keeping the 12 months um, in place. So the March, April, May, June, that, that's important for going concern. So they're actually forecasting out scenarios on, on, on revenue and profit on the budget. And under the worst case scenario, what does that do to our cash flows? And what actually ended up happening is they decided that um, it was reasonable that they might end up in a um, in a, a, a scenario where they kind of lost, I think it was minus 20%, I can't remember if it was minus 20% or minus 25%, but ultimately they said, look, that scenario is quite possible. What's gonna happen if that happens to not only our ability to operate, but also our ability to pay our debts? And you can see that under the worst case scenario, there was actually a cash shortfall, um, which would have impacted their ability to operate um, from around about June to December. So the going concern was, would we be able to operate during that period? But also, will we be able to pay our debts in that period? And the maximum possibility of shortfall was in August, September. So there were two risks at play here, um, solvency and going concern. The thing with solvency is that they've got so much access to finance that they never really had a risk of being un unable to pay their debts. They were always gonna be able to pay their debts. So solvency was never really an issue for them. But the question was, was that shortfall gonna create a going concern risk because operationally, could they keep trading? Um, and what they did with that was, they literally worked out 
what they would do in order to bring that headroom back down under the green line. And there were four levels of things they could do. This all looks very advanced, but to be honest, any organization of any size could do this. And they figured out that they had proper appropriate plans that they could use to bring that risk back down under the line under the green line so under the worst case scenario if they had to they could ch change certain cash flow events to be able to carry on operating in other words it was still reasonable that going concern was appropriate now that's the solvency and going concern i like that just purely the way they've outlined it because if you're looking for an example of what your auditors are looking for in terms of solvency and going concern it's a great example no matter what the size of your business it's just a nice document that outlines essentially what you're looking for and there's six steps there from looking at your budget in the past assessing your budget process did we get it right last year what did we have to adjust in our budget process this year what are our goals and visions this year how does that impact our cash flow and our headroom and then if there's any risk of us be, you know, not, not being able to operate or solvency, do we have actions that can mitigate that and will they work? And that's your solvency and going concern assessment. So in this case, they were happy that at the start of the pandemic last year in the trading in their trading forecast, that their solvency and going concern was pretty much complete. That's all solvency and and uh, and going concern. Now, I'm, I'm getting insecure because I haven't heard from Aletta for a while. I'm wondering if she has any comments. I know, Aletta, you will stop me if you have any comments at this point, or I'm just going to keep going um, because now I'm going to get into impairment. So Kevin, look at yes. I'm still here and I'm finding what you've done really interesting. Uh, I really love the way you've put this table together. Um, so I want to say well done and you haven't lost us. We are here. We with Good. you. Keep going. Good job. I never, thank you, Aletta. I never normally talk so long without talking to Aletta. So I was like, is everybody still with me? It's very quiet here in the room today. Uh, I'm also sitting in the office in Sydney wondering if everybody's still out there because Sydney's starting to get really, really quiet because of the, the, the various clusters that are developing. So it's great. Glad to hear you're all still with me. So let's get back to this asset comparison table. This is not. Uh, this is just a repeat of what I had on this on 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 the slide previously. Just remember that our solvency and going concern are are using forecast and cash flow forecast on a rolling basis based on time of issue of financials or when the assessment's been made for two very specific purposes. One is ability to pay debts as they become due. The other one is is there a high liquidity risk period where my operations might be affected in the next 12 months or in the next 12 forecast period. Now. Now we're going to get to cash flow um, for impairment, and and I think by now you, you you would have got the concept that I'm I'm going to strip a lot of those cash flows out to get back to what my impairment assessment, which has actually got a very different purpose to really everything else in terms of budgeting and forecasting. Because this is the impairment. If you're using value in use under impairment, the purpose of that assessment is to assess whether the cash inflows and outflows that relate to the asset reflect the current condition of those assets at the reporting date um, and, can, can, and can support their carrying them out. Goals that the entity has included in their budgeting and cash flow forecasting process, which are not yet committed to, are actually not relevant to the assessment because, because they don't reflect what the assets can currently do at the reporting date. Goals that are capital goals that, that are yet to be committed to or that are just part of the plan must be stripped out because if those goals aren't reflected in the carrying amount of the asset, in other words, we haven't yet improved the assets, then you can't include the cash flows in the assessment because then you're actually doubling up. So that's really the purpose of, of, of the impairment assessment. So. There's a couple of slides here, impairment approach, and, and this will help explain why when you get to impairment, and I'm probably talking to a lot of clients and a lot of boards and, and management about why the auditors and, and, and so forth want to pull things out of your budget that, 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 that don't reflect what your plans are. And it's really about, as I said, cur current form and, and, and current, current ability. The aim of the impairment test is to test that existing assets at the reporting date in their current form can generate cash inflows, revenue, and that net of outflows after efficient use, the present value of that calculation is 
is, is, is essentially able to support their carrying amount. So anything that's an investment or an enhancement to the business, like buying new assets or re refitting the assets, if that hasn't already been committed to at the reporting date, has to come out of the cash flow forecast because the assets don't currently sit on the balance sheet, including those investments or enhancements. That's really, really why we pull things out of the cash flow forecasts when we get to impairment testing. Now, first thing to do is what's in the CGU? Now, whatever you're testing in terms of value in use, there's a CGU, whether that be at a business level or at a lower CGU level. The assets in the CGU are things like goodwill and brand and customer relationships and all those things. Um, but the most important thing in an impairment test is to essentially keep the cash flows in the value in use calc consistent with the assets that you that are in the CGU. So like I said, if, if, the, if you haven't yet, let's take software as an example. If you're planning to invest in new software, like Next PLC was planning to invest in new software at the head office, but you haven't yet invested in it, then the new investments not yet on your balance sheet because you, have, you, haven't, you, have, you, have, you haven't bought new software or you haven't invested in new software. So then that, that software won't be in the CGU because it's not already on your balance sheet. If it's not on your balance sheet because you haven't done the investment, then the cash flows in the calculation mustn't include the cash flows from a new investment because the new investment hasn't happened yet. And all you're trying to do is prove the carrying amount of the assets at the reporting date in their current condition. So that's the basic assumption of impairment. If the present value of the cash flows um, in the CGU is greater than the current carrying amount in their current condition, well then clearly the existing assets as they are at the reporting date are able to be recovered in their current conditions and off you go. Now, where, where, where the standard setter went with this was, well, okay, we've got to do this test, but we've got to use reliable cash flows in our test when we're doing impairment. So what they decided to do was, surely an entity which has a robust budgeting process that's the starting point. So the one thing that does interact um, in the impairment testing standard with, shall we call it forecasting, that is used for going concern and solvency, is that cash flow piggybacks, cash flow testing for impairment testing piggybacks off the budget process of an entity. And the reason why the standard setter did that was because they assume that the budget process that gave rise to the cash flow forecast was a robust budget process. In other words, the, the entity has, has, has gone through a, 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 good, a, a good process of, of a reliable budgeting process and, and, and the budget and the forecast that's dropped out is achievable, it's reasonable, and it's a good roadmap for what the entity is planning to do um, um, in, in the next 12 months. So that's why we start there. It, 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 it's, it's generally accepted that you've got to start with something that is reliable in terms of cash flow forecasting. And they start with the, the budgeting of the entity because it assumes that an entity has gone through a valid budgeting process. Now, these are the requirements from the impairment standard, ASB 136. You might not have seen it laid out this way. Um, this is something I've kind of been working on probably for 14 years on what is required before you do your impairment test to make sure that the starting point being the budget and the forecast are reliable and, and can be used. In other words, these are your tests of controls. If you're an auditor and you're auditing a client's impairment assessment and you're starting with their budget and forecast, these are actually your five tests of controls are the forecasts based on the most recent budgets approved by management. That's required in the standard. And the reason why they want that to be, to be in there is because we know we're going to adjust the cash flows for the impairment test, but we want to start with something that's reliable. We want something that management have committed to. And that's why the budgets must be approved and the forecasts that's dropped out of those must be approved. Next thing is, can, can management actually, can they actually do budgeting and forecast? In other words, have they demonstrated their ability to put together budgets and forecasts that are accurate and complete? Third, third one is reasonability. Have they done due diligence on the prior period budget to actual to understand causes and differences? That's a requirement of the standard. So that's third row in the table. Has the organization done, that I'd use the word due diligence, but have they essentially looked at their previous year's budgeting process, understood the causes and differences from how they got to actual and made adjustments to their budgeting process? 
are their current year assumptions consistent with the budgeting process in the prior year? And if not, have they made adjustments to it? And finally, how does the budget reflect the best estimate of the economic conditions over the budget period? In other words, have management adjusted their budget to take care of things like a, a pandemic that's suddenly creeping up on them? Those five rows look eerily familiar to this slide, which I put up earlier. A, a reasonable and rational budget process talks about reviewing budget processing, understanding causes of differences. So all the things in red on there, they're not set by the standard setter, they're actually just good practice in building a budget and getting a forecast right. So if you're doing a good budget process, you should be able to pass those five criteria from the impairment standard with no problem. They don't set anything that you shouldn't be doing in an organization in terms of good budget setting and good forecast setting, um, because, because it ultimately just assumes that you've got a, a robust budget and forecasting process. It's all the standard is looking for. And then it says, adjust those cash flows, those reliable cash flows, to align with the current condition of the assets in the CGU. So in other words, start with a, with a budget uh, and, a, and a forecast that comes from a robust budget setting process, but then strip out the cash flows that don't align with the with, with, with the assets in the CGU. If the assets at the reporting date don't yet embody, let's say, re, um, you know, reinvestment and capital goals, take the capital goals out of the cash flow forecast because the assets in their current conditions don't yet reflect those because all you're trying to do is then adjust the reliable forecast to actually test whether the current assets in their current condition can support um, their carrying amount. And that's it, that, that is really the interaction. Um, one of the things that um, I actually have on the screen here, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, you can go and have a look at this yourself, but um, it, it's a good example of how you align the assets in the CGU with the cash flows in your budget. Um, and I, I'm gonna talk about working capital. So when you, when you think about a cash generating unit, yes, we all know that things like Goodwill and brands and software and all those assets are in there. But the idea of working capital is that you, you've got to align your working capital in your CGU with the cash flows in your forecast. Now, this comes from um, BDO's impairment publication. There is a link in, 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 in the presentation. I think a letter put it in, I put it in once, and I think at the end of the presentation, a letter uh, put, it, put, 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 put it on a single slide all by itself. This comes from our BDO impairment assessment guide, which has been updated at the BDO global level for the impact of COVID-19. So it's a good source reference in terms of impairment assessments. And what it actually does, it tries to, it tries to explain how you align assets in the CGU with cash flows in your modeling. Very often, and, and, and so here's the example, he has a five-year cash flow forecast. And you can see there in row A, we've got the pre-tax cash flows in our, in our impairment test. So these are the forecasts of um, our revenue minus minus expenses. So, so in year one, there's going to be 35,000 currency units um, from, from, from operating activities. And uh, it also gives us what is our working capital if we have opening working capital. In other words, if we've already got some cash on the balance sheet, um, we've got 2.8 worth of currency units worth of opening cash, and we're going to invest 2.450 in row D during the year to produce the 35,000. And then at the closing uh, balance of working capital is 5250, which flows into year two. In other words, that's basic opening cash, new cash required, closing cash for next year, that's working capital adjustment. Now that's essentially the working, um, the building blocks of our impairment assessment. And there's two ways to do an impairment assessment from here. One is to actually say, all right, do I have cash on the balance sheet in my CGU already? In other words, is working capital in my CGU or are my assets in my CGU excluding working capital? In other words, this is, this is an alignment of what's in the CGU versus your cash flow forecast. There's two ways to do it. If you actually have um, working capital included in the carrying value of the CGU, in other words, when you have your assets that, are that you're testing for impairment, including let's say a working capital balance of 2.8 million, then you don't need to insert that into the cash flows because it's already on your balance sheet. So your cash flows, your pre-tax cash flows um, being the 35, and I'll just go back, remember the 35,000 was our pre-tax cash flows, that's revenue minus expenses during the year. That 35 um, already assumes that the CGU has an opening balance of 2.8 million worth of opening um, 
uh, working capital. So you only have to inject another 2.45 being the movement for the year into the, the modeling for the whole thing to work. So taking the step back, $35,000 worth in terms of revenue minus expenses. The CGU assumes it has an opening balance of 2.8 million with a working capital. And so therefore the, the pre-tax cash flows must, must have an increase um, of the movement in the year in order to work. However, if you have a CGU which doesn't have working capital in the CGU, so we actually don't have the opening balance of 2.8 million, what's going to have happen is that your model, the cash flow model, not only needs the 2.8 million, but it also needs the closing balance of 5.2 um, in order to set up the years two, three, four, and five. In other words, the pre-tax pre cash flows in your CGU model needs to be 40 million or 40 currency units, 40.25 currency units, because the CGU assets don't have the opening balance. And so it needs a bit more cash flow to work because it doesn't have an opening balance in the asset side. So that's an example of your carrying values of CGUs and your cash flows must align. Now, if you didn't get the last three slides at all and it's just like, whoa, what's going on? That's the reason why I've put it there and why I've got a link to the guide because it's just an indication of that the most important thing with impairment is aligning the assets in the CGU with the forecast, not necessarily aligning the cash flow with what's called what's called the forecast budget and financial uh, financial and capital goals. The purpose of the impairment test is to align the carrying amount in the CGU of those assets with their cash flows. It starts with the cash flows from the budgeting process, but it's adjusted to align with the assets, not to align with management's goals, because management's goals don't necessarily align with the current ability of the assets in the CGU. And so sometimes you can have very, very different item, very, very diff different um, answers here. And I mean, I'll just go back uh, back a slide. You'll see that in this case, um, the recoverable amount was 375 current, 375, 379 CUs. Um, whereas on the next one, it's 377.925 currency units. And that's all because of the assets that were included in the CGU. This is not an easy concept to get. It's often why there's a lot, lot of arguments um, between management and auditors and so forth. But the most important thing was an impairment assessment when you're basing it off a budget or a forecast period um, is that you've adjusted the cash flows from the forecast to align with the assets in the CGU not necessarily aligned with the forecast capital goals that might have been put into the forecast uh, and budget uh, budget process at, at the beginning of the budget period. And then finally, just um, the discount rate. Um, be careful with discount rates and, and cash flow forecasting. The one thing that we haven't really pointed out in, in all three assessments is that there's very little discounting of cash flows in your um, going concern assessment and your solvency assessments. They are they are statements of cash flow fact. So when you're doing a, a solvency assessment and a going concern assessment, it's based on your budget and your forecast. No one discounts those when they're doing budgeting. But when you get to impairment assessment, there is a discount rate that is applied against the cash flows. And so you just need to make sure you're not double counting um, your uncertainty. A discount rate by its very nature is trying to factor in uncertainty in cash flow forecasting. So what often happens here is your uncertainty in cash flow forecasting is, is really a, a factor of how much stress testing and scenario building you've done. If you've built a budget and a forecast that has had no stress testing, in other words, no, no modeling has been done against it. And I've kind of, kind of just thrown a slide together here, which has got a lot of detail going on. But ultimately, if you, if, you, if, you, if you take what the next PLC guys did, they had three scenarios. In this example on screen, there's four. But what next PLC did is they had three scenarios in terms of their revenue, and they stress tested their forecast and came to an assumption that their forecast was appropriate and it adequately uh, cap, uh, captured all all the scenarios. In that scenario, the discount rate in the impairment test would probably be a lot lower than if you haven't done stress testing. Because if you haven't done stress testing in your cash flow forecasting as a budget process, then your risk of uncertainty in those cash flows is higher, which means your discount rate in your impairment test needs to be higher. But don't don't be caught out by by you have to use a certain discount rate. You, um, um, when it comes to these things, um, what actually has to happen is your discount rate must reflect the uncertainty in the cash flow forecasting. And if you've already stress tested your cash flow forecasting during a budget period, 
your discount rate should reflect that by being slightly lower. That's just one sort of key piece to, to bear in mind. Now, a letter at 11.59, I'm done, which means I think I nailed it in terms of timing. Um, final thoughts on this is just keep in mind the purpose of the test. The impairment assessments, going concern assessments, and solvency assessments, they are all very different in purpose, even though they all rely on the budget and the forecast. But the consistency of cash flows and the consistency of purpose must flow to the end assessment. And depending on the timing of the assessment, in other words, when you're doing it, and depending on how, the basis of how you prepared the cash flow forecast will also drive how you adjust those numbers. In particular, if there's capital goals that are in your forecast, which have not yet been brought into account in the carrying amount of assets, the impairment assessment will have to be adjusted for those. And that's the big takeaway from today. So those are my final thoughts. And Aletha, at that point, I think um, I'm gonna hand over to you because I've covered what I wanted to talk about today. I have got a Thank slide you. here for the impairment um, guide that I referred to. It is available for free on our website. Um, and with that, Aletha, I will hand over to you. Kevin, thank you very much uh, for that. I think it was a really timely presentation to remind us of three very important things. Um, the requirements around solvency, um, the going concern assessment that would be required, and it will be 12 months after the directors and the auditors sign the report. So if, if you expecting to sign end of October and you're doing it now, you're looking for the next 16 months. And then finally, the impairment of the asset and the asset values. And those impairment tests happen at 30 June, and we're not allowed to use hindsight. Um, That's right. So Kevin, thank you very much for that. And thank you for staying to the time. Quite amazing you are. Um, I want to talk about of some of the things we do at BDO that if you are overwhelmed, you could come to us and we could help. Uh, the one was the valuation on the previous slide, valuation services, which our corporate finance friends uh, do. Um, financial education, ma uh, sorry, there it is, the financial education masterclasses um, and the business growth program that I talked about right at the start. Um, please contact us if you need more information. I think the financial education um, whole area is such an inciting area to make a difference in businesses and make sure we've got sustainable businesses. Um, the Alexa, other thing sorry, was... Can I, can I, Alexa, can I, the, the building the cash flow forecast, I, I actually put this one here because I actually... I took a lot out of it myself. So I just want to encourage you there because even if you're a small entity, impairment assessments is one thing, but actually knowing how to do cash flow forecasting is really important. So I actually just want to point out the first yeah. one there is I actually took a lot out of that one if, if you're a small business and you want to kind of learn how to do that. Thank you very much. I think the next one we have is the audit ready services. So I know a lot of our clients are starting to get ready for their, ready for their auditor's visit. If you are needing any help around position papers, reconciliations, lease accounting, whatever, please reach out. Kevin and I have a whole team of people across Australia who can help with that. We're currently busy with a big project where we're using IFRS specialist across the whole country working on one very big client. Um, it's exciting for us because usually we work very much location by location and so exciting to work cross borders and, and share experiences and pulling the best from everywhere. Um, so please contact us if we can help you with any of these. Uh, Kevin, I think the next one was around um, general purpose financial statements. If you're starting to think about um, that transition to general purpose financial statements, um, maybe now, maybe next year when it's mandatory, again, please speak up. Um, it's, a, it's a long journey, a lot of things to be done. Uh, there's a five-step process and we can help you along the way. If you're just going from RDR to AASB 1060, you will be in step five. We've got a tool uh, that we can show you how amazing that is and how we can help you. Um, Kevin, and I think uh, then we're back to the, the leaders across the country. So Lynn in Adelaide, Ashley in Perth. Uh, Ashley didn't join us today because her little two-year-old has a birthday party today. And we said to her, please enjoy the birthday. You never get a two-year-old birthday party again. Uh, so it's Kevin, thank you. For told, I told her to bring the little one to the impairment assessment. I thought he'd get more out of it. <laughs> 
<laughs> and Ashley thought she'll rather listen to me. That's fine. <laughs> and I have the birthday party. Um, obviously, Kevin in Sydney and then Clark in Brisbane. So please feel free to reach out to us or anybody in our team. You can see there's a new person right at the bottom. Uh, Sean joined very recently. Um, um, so, you know, the team is still growing. Uh, we both Kevin and I are interviewing at the moment for more staff. Uh, so please reach out. We would love to work with you, love to help you, um, help you to focus on these things so you can focus on growing your business. Uh, we're saying thank you very much. Happy end of financial year. And we'll speak again in July. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Bye. Goodbye. Bye, Alessa. Goodbye, everybody.